What if you had a team that was basically all Superman and left them here on Earth for, like, the whole time? The MCU is setting out to prove once more that it's not the marquee of the character, but the execution when it brings one of its lesser-known creations to the big screen in The Eternals. Offered as a makeup gift to comic book legend Jack Kirby to come back to Marvel after creating the new gods for the distinguished competition, Kirby was able to set up his new new gods at the House of Ideas. But just how do these powerful science experiments measure up against Earth's mightiest heroes? The Eternals that are making their way to the big screen is a fairly big group, especially with them all being introduced at once. But it won't be the full set. Being 7,000 years old means that things will happen. Like between Alars and Suisan, also not appearing in the movie. Now that doesn't mean that none of this family tree is entirely absent from the MCU already, though. His brother made an indelible mark on the old shared universe by snapping half of it out of existence. Yep, Thanos has a brother and was an Eternal, in the comics. In the comics, Ego isn't a Celestial, but then we only have Thanos' word on his history, so who knows what we'll find out. Uh, back to Thanos' brother, Eros. Eros was the type that took the whole I'm a lover, not a fighter thing super seriously. Eros went looking for a place where he could be himself and found Earth, where he joined the Avengers and they promptly renamed him Star Fox. There are a base set of abilities that Eternals get that are enough to deal with most threats. Being half Earth Eternal and half Titan Eternal, those powers go up a notch. But there's one extra power that would help Star Fox deal with one of the Avengers' heavy hitters, the Scarlet Witch. As we've learned during her arc in the MCU, the more bummed Wanda gets, the more her power increases along with her control of it. Star Fox literally emanates good vibes as part of his Eternals-related psionic abilities so that anyone within 25 feet of him feels groovy, and it's always on. He can concentrate and turn up the good vibrations to levels best achieved in more intimate surroundings. Alright, I might start a fight here. Stretchy powers are silly, and super speed is literally the only power you need. If you can move faster than anything that is thrown at you, then the only stakes are if you take a moment to make sure the hurt that was meant for you doesn't hurt someone else. If you're wondering why Quicksilver keeps getting sidelined in two different franchises, it's because he could probably solve most of the story on his own. All of the Eternals are fast. In fact, a lot of heroes are fast, meaning that heroes whose whole thing is being fast are really, really fast. And just to make things a little confusing, the Eternal that has dedicated themselves to being crazy fast isn't the one named Fastos, but instead Macari. Macari knows that crazy speed is the only power he needs, so he neglected his other Eternal's powers and just went for going fast, granting him the extra powers once you're moving at or beyond relativistic speeds. Macari and his need for speed has caused him to be mistaken for Hermes among the Greeks, and later Mercury. Macari shares his speed advantage by building crazy fast vehicles. Speed really is all you need. Of course, Wanda isn't the only heavy hitter in the Avengers Rolodex. Captain Marvel might have been the inspiration for the Avengers, but she's been fashionably late to the party as the only Avenger that got her own entrance to the big showdown with Thanos. That entrance, of course, has to be a guided missile through Sanctuary 2. She even took a headbutt from the fully equipped Thanos before he palmed the Power Stone for a power punch. The reality is, though, that any one Eternal might be enough. They all have invulnerability, super strength, super speed, flight, and energy and molecular manipulation, just for starters. If an Eternal has a little extra in one space, it's because of intense interest rather than random chance of other superpowers. Thena changed her name from Azura as part of an agreement with the Olympians that had Thena posing as Athena to the Greeks. That's because she's gotten really good at fighting, including amping her energy manipulation abilities to make light, concussive, and heat beams. She can also make weapons out of that light energy. But we know how two characters who shoot energy beams fighting will end up. Beam versus beam. The worst superpower fight move ever where the two characters have a reverse tug of war. Of all the Eternals, Cersei is the one that ignored that whole don't interfere with the humans thing the mostest. She first made waves when she turned the crew of Odysseus' ship into pigs. Yeah, that was her. She even fell in love with humans, including the unstuck-from-time Dane Whitman, the Black Knight who will be played by Kit Harington. 
Vision is a pretty big hitter who hasn't had a real chance to shine in the Avengers. He delivered the final blow to Ultron, but in Infinity War, he was sidelined early by Corvus Glaive's Glaive. That's right, the guy was named after his weapon, and his weapon is called a Glaive. But it's not so much about how Cersei could overpower Vision, but what she could do for him. Vision is coming to terms with what exactly he is, being a unique thing in the universe. But there is a hang-up in that he has fallen in love with a woman and being a synthesoid creates some barriers. Cersei is the only Eternal who has achieved level 5 in matter manipulation, allowing her to do things like turn sailors into pigs and maybe turn the synthesoid into a real boy. Man, I mean, he was only alive for a few years, but he was in a relationship with adult Wanda. You know, maybe that relationship was weirder than we thought. King Gosunen, like all of the Eternals, has those baseline Superman powers, but long ago he decided he didn't need them. Instead, Kingo spent most of his time bopping around Asia, learning the various ways the humans had to fight each other, and became so good at it that he felt he didn't need those Eternal superpowers. In the comics, he spends his time in the modern age as an actor in samurai films. For the big screen, Kingo, played by Kumail Nanjiani, will be headed to the cinematic big leagues, Bollywood. Seriously, they make twice the numbers that Hollywood does and have a larger audience. Hollywood needs to add more elaborate dance numbers. The MCU just met the master of kung fu and his deadly hands in Shang-Chi. The uh, other master martial artist is on the bubble as far as how much the MCU continues to acknowledge his existence. While Shang-Chi benefits from being trained from a young age by his ageless father, Kingo has been at this thing for quite a while. Okay, so you might need a pencil and paper for this one. Most people know the story of Icarus, who made wax wings that allowed him to fly, but he flew too close to the sun and they melted and he crashed down to Earth. We've established that the Eternals have either been mistaken for or the basis of some of the myths and legends over the course of time on Earth, but how did that go down Marvel style? Well, first there was an Eternal who totally wasn't named Icarus. He fell in love with a human woman and had a child that was named Icarus with a C. Icarus with a C loved flying with daddy, but didn't inherit that ability. So, Fastos and Macari got together and made little Icarus with a C some wings. Just after he delivered those wings, he was called away to fight Deviants, which is like his only job, so… But it took years, and little Icarus with a C got impatient for daddy to come home and teach him how to use those wings, and felt he could probably figure it out. To an extent, that was true because he flew too high and was unable to breathe, causing him to crash to Earth. To honor his memory, Dad became Icarus with a K. Icarus is the big gun in the Eternals' arsenal of all big guns. He is a prime Eternal, which turns the whole Eternal thing up to 11. So why not throw him up against the Hulk? It wouldn't be unheard of. During a time when Cersei was trying to demonstrate that humans could be heroic, he ended up booting Red Hulk into a volcano. As we've seen, sometimes names can be deceptive. Fastos isn't the fast one. Icarus isn't the one who flew too high. And Vampiro is not in fact a vampire. Instead, he was a professional wrestler with a sweet gimmick. Part of that gimmick was being an Eternal, the other was having fangs like a vampire. Now, while he didn't actually vampire anyone, acting like one might attract the attention of the Daywalker himself, Blade, who also had a brief stint as an Avenger. While Vampiro needed an assist from Thor to defeat the Deviant Toro Rojo, Blade's Daywalker abilities are probably not going to be enough to deal with those inherent Eternal powers. Zuras preceded Icarus as the leader of the Olympian Eternals. His pops, Kronos, figured there was more to their ability to manipulate cosmic energies, the most powerful thing in the Marvel Universe, and found out that there was, but with a catch. He contained cosmic energy in a tube, but did not check to see if that tube was rated for containing cosmic energy. It wasn't. The inevitable kablooey resulted in Kronos becoming a cosmic being and wiping out the rest of the Eternals. But wait, you say. Yep, this is comic books, no one stays dead. For the Eternals, the comeback was thanks to reactivation chambers. When they came back, they found out that Kronos' little experiment boosted the powers of the Eternals. Zurus' specialty became his disintegrator beams that resembled lightning, making him a prime stand-in for Zeus. So if his daughter Thena managed to not win that whole beam versus beam battle with Captain Marvel, Zurus can definitely clean up. That's not entirely random. In the MCU, Captain Marvel gets her powers from the Space Stone, making her another Infinity Stone boosted hero that was given off cosmic background radiation, though they may be using the same blocks for their power. 
Okay, so if Fastos isn't the fast one, then what's his deal? Well, the Greek god got mixed up as Hephaestus, the god of metal and fire. Fastos's big obsession is tech. He builds all the sweet gear that the Eternals employ, including Kingo's sword. His other obsession was trying to find any evidence that all life wasn't meaningless. This puts him opposite the Avengers lust for life tech genius Tony Stark. Tony may have had a knack for inventions, but like Rocket says, he's only a genius on Earth. Becoming a cosmic being like an alien out of Star Trek was not Kronos' only trick. On top of the regular powers, he was able to control the souls of fallen folk and use them to animate bodies which he could also create from matter. He also became an embodiment of time itself, which he uses to his advantage without Baron Mordo getting all judgy. While Doctor Strange isn't really a joiner except for joining the Defenders and the Illuminati, Doctor Strange was there when Cap told the Avengers to assemble, so he's at least on call. Now, even with the Time Stone, Doctor Strange doesn't have dominion over time the way Kronos does, plus that whole nightmare army he can create. Cory Foss is not high on the scale of punchy and kicky and blasty Eternals. Instead, he spent his extraordinarily long life mastering music and composition. When Sprite went and turned all the Eternals mortal sans their memories of being an Eternal, something we'll probably learn more about in the Eternals movie, the master of music who can play any known instrument became a DJ. Look, when you've mastered music in general, you're already just taking pieces of music and jamming them together with other pieces of music, so maybe being a DJ really is the peak expression of his gift. And is still probably winning the talent showcase against Scott Lang's magic tricks. Everyone knows about the lost city of Atlantis, and after appearing as a hotspot in the middle of the ocean during Iron Man 2, everyone has been wondering where Namor is. Namor has a powerful fan, Kevin Feige. So you'd think he'd show up sooner or later. Earlier this summer, Narco star Tana Tuerta was cast as someone, perhaps Namor? With all eyes on the Atlantic, the Pacific Ocean has its own thing going on. Like a group of Eternals relocated to Earth after a defeat on Titan forming the Oceanic Watch. Oceanus, the leader of that team, has only been mentioned, but being an Eternal, he's probably more than capable of handling Namor, who did at one point join the Avengers. Over time, the Eternals have mixed and mingled with the elite of the Marvel Universe, having a more or less on-and-off attitude towards only fighting deviants or helping out in general. One of the most frequent encounters for the Eternals are the Asgardians and their champion, the Mighty Thor. A quartet of Eternals teamed up with Hammer Time for a while, about a thousand years ago, which included Icarus with a K's dad, Viraco. Viraco met his end by proving Drax right. He allowed himself to be eaten by the world-devouring worm while harnessing a max charge of his cosmic energy. Of all of these, this might be the best fight. And as you know, Thor has a tendency to end up fighting his friends from work. Now, if you're a big fan of Star Wars or just someone who follows screenwriters, you're also probably really tired of hearing about the hero's journey. First outlined by Joseph Campbell, it was a rough template of elements almost every heroic story has. Screenwriters turned this observation into a set of rules. One of the first stories of a hero that forms the basis of all heroic writing is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And wouldn't you know it, he's an Eternal. Old Gil didn't get the message regarding leaving the humans be, and instead went about inspiring epic poems, doing half of Hercules' twelve tasks, literally laying the foundation for the Roman Empire. This was because he didn't know he was an Eternal. In fact, he had been searching for a way to extend his life, not knowing that was baked in. While completely lopsided, it would be fitting to put Earth's first hero against the first Avenger himself, Captain America. So maybe the Avengers find a way to luck out in each matchup, and it looks like they'll get the better of the Eternals. Well, they have one last trick up their sleeve. They can combine their minds and wills into the Uni-Mind. It's a bit like the trick the Three Doctors pulled in the Three Doctors Doctor Who special, except it doesn't just increase computing power, it can actually manifest as a figure. The power can be latent as well, because when they were turned human, a low-watt version of the Unimind kept four of them together and eventually lifted the tab on their inner eternalness. All that attention was on what the Eternals were doing when Loki, Ultron, and Thanos attacked the Earth, but the real question is going to be why aren't the Ska Band-sized team of basically Kryptonians but extra just solving this for us? 